Interested in learning about wine, but not sure where to start? You're in the right place. Welcome to the Cork and Fizz Guide to Wine podcast. I'm your host, Haley Bullman, and I'm so glad you're here. I'm a wine enthusiast turned wine educator and founder of the Seattle-based wine tasting business, Cork and Fizz. It is my goal to build your confidence in wine by making it approachable and lots of fun. You can expect to learn everything from how to describe your favorite wine to what to pair with dinner tonight and so much more. Whether you're a casual wine sipper or a total cork dork like myself, this podcast is for you. So grab yourself a glass and let's dive in. One thing that I know is true is that the world of wine can be incredibly intimidating for beginners. It definitely felt that way to me when I was first starting to learn about it. And it really doesn't help that so much of what media and marketing has led you to believe about wine simply isn't true. So I'm going to do my best today to dispel some of the top wine rumors and myths that I've heard so that you can be properly informed. I have five of them to go through with you today, but if you have more, please let me know. You can email me at Haley at CorkandFizz.com. Or send me a message on Instagram at Cork and Fizz. All right, let's dive into it. So starting with wine myth number one, this is the myth that you should enjoy white wine straight out of the fridge and red wine at room temperature. In reality, both would be so much better if you enjoyed them right in between those two temperatures. You see, the thing is, if white wine is too cold, you lose the nuance of flavor, and it can end up tasting sour and bitter. And along with that, the aromas will be muted, and it will make it nearly impossible to distinguish any particular smells. I actually have a story to go along with this one where I can say, even from experience, that this is 100% true. I remember when I first was getting into wine that, remember that trip down in Willamette Valley? I always talk about this. This is like where my love of wine came from. Well, during this trip, we tasted a lot, we meaning my husband and I, tasted a lot of Chardonnay down in Willamette Valley. And it was incredible. I I loved this wine and I was never really much of a Chardonnay person before this. So I obviously had to buy a few bottles while we were down there. So I remember bringing some back and and I can remember having it in the fridge, pouring myself a glass and being so excited. I was just going to have a glass of wine. I think I was going to fold laundry because I was like, well, I need some wine if I'm going to do this very boring chore. So I poured a glass, took a sip and all the utter disappointment I felt when that wine tasted nothing like what I remembered. And so sadly, I set the wine on the counter and just went to go fold the clothes without any wine. I mean, I know it it doesn't sound possible, but apparently it is. So I finished folding the clothes and I came back and I don't know what was in me, but I was like, you know what? Who knows? Maybe let's let's just try another sip just for the hell of it. (laughs) Maybe this will be good. And turns out 30 minutes of sitting on the countertop where it had a chance to warm up and not be quite as cold as it was in the fridge It tasted just like I remembered, and I was very excited. So, goes to say, white wine, you do not want it too cold. You want to be able to experience all of the flavor that it has. Now, on the other hand, if your red wine is too warm, it'll taste flat. The smell and the taste of alcohol will be way more apparent, and you'll miss out on all the fun and subtle flavors that the wine has to offer. Another fun story on this one. They're not really fun stories, I guess, but I do have a story for this one. And honestly, it's happened more than once, but at restaurants, I am that person that will ask for a chiller if the bottle of red wine that I ordered is too warm. This has happened many times and it's happened at some of my favorite restaurants. And I'll admit it is a pet peeve of mine. I try not to have any like wine snob tendencies. And this is just one of those things where like, and again, I think it's that education piece and and knowing, you know, what the, where the wine should be stored and, and what temperature is best to serve it at. But I find so many restaurants store their wine on shelves on display, either 
in the kitchen or nearby. And that's just, the wine is going to get far too warm. And unless you're moving some of it to the fridge before you're going to serve it to me, it's going to be far too warm when I go to drink it. And while getting a chiller could work if I ordered a bottle, the worst is when I order a glass of wine and you can just tell that it's too warm. So, Mm, yeah, not a lot you can do about the glass when it's too warm, but if you do order a bottle of red wine and it seems a little warm, seems a little flat, the alcohol's a little extreme in it, don't be afraid to ask for a chiller. Not a problem. Okay, here's the good news, though. When you're drinking wine at home, there's a simple fix that will allow you to enjoy the wine so much more. So for white wine, you can put it in the fridge. But my recommendation is to simply take it out about 30 minutes before you plan to pour the wine or before you plan to drink it. For reds, you can, again, store them at room temperature, but I recommend putting them in the fridge about 20 to 30 minutes before you're going to pour them or enjoy them. Now, if you want to get a little more nuanced, there is a guide for different styles of wine, primarily based on the body of the wine. And remember, the body of the wine is the weight of the wine. Essentially, how heavy does it feel in your mouth? So when it comes to sparkling wine or light-bodied white wine, think um, light-bodied white wine would be like a Sauvignon Blanc or like that Vino Verde Portuguese wine that I've recommended many times. Those are all very, they're very light, they're very fresh. These are wines that you could enjoy ice cold, aka straight out of the fridge. Sparkling wine especially is very nice right out of the fridge. It also makes it way easier to open (laughs) the sparkling wine. Having that colder temperature means that the the cork isn't going to fly out as quickly. There isn't going to be as much pressure in the bottle. Now, if you have a higher-end sparkling wine, you paid a lot for a bottle of champagne, I would still recommend taking it out of the fridge, you know, maybe like 10 minutes. You know, just give it a little time to warm up. And same kind of thing with the light-bodied wine, right? If this is like a porch pounder, what's another word for it? Or like a, basically like you're just like $5 bottle you picked up the grocery store and it's like 95 degrees outside and you just wanted something cold, please just drink that wine straight out of the fridge. (laughs) However, if this is like a, you know, a nice quality Loire Valley Sauvignon Blanc, you know, you picked it up at a wine shop after tasting it during their public tasting and you really just want to make sure you still get everything out of it that you got when you first tasted it, it might do you some good just to take it out of the fridge a little early. Now, moving down, your rosés and full-bodied white wines. Those are going to be, you're just going to follow my recommendation before, take them out of the fridge about 30 minutes before you drink them. Moving down the list, we have light and medium-bodied red wines. These you're going to place in the fridge for about 20 to 30 minutes before pouring. Some examples of these, Pinot Noir, Gamay, they fall under this category. Also, sometimes Grenache as well is another good one that you can have a little chill on it. And then finally, your bold red wines. These are the ones that just need a very short cooling period. Give them about 15 minutes in the fridge. It just helps bring them down. Now, of course, if it's cooler in your house and you're already at about 65 degrees or you pulled these out of, let's say, a cellar, like the your unfinished basement, or you have a wine fridge, you might not need to do this at all. But this is just for those of us that are storing our wine wherever we can and want to get it to the right temperature. Last thing I'll say about temperature of the wine for enjoying, in general, if you notice that there's not very much flavor in the wine, warm it up a little bit. It might be too cold. If you notice your nose burning of alcohol when you have a, when you sniff the wine and when you have a taste, cool the wine down. It needs to chill out a little bit. Okay, moving on to wine myth number two. This is the myth that wines with screw caps are cheap and inferior when compared to wines sealed with a cork. And let me tell you, this just isn't true. While screw caps are very popular today, they actually go way back. They were first invented in France in the 60s. Yes, I said the 60s. You know wine history, you know that France is the motherland of wine. So who are we to argue with anything that France has come up with when it comes to wine? There are also a few reasons why screw caps are becoming more mainstream today. I mean, first, they're easier to open. If you're a wine drinker, 
I can almost guarantee you've had a moment where you wanted to open a bottle of wine and you could not find a gosh darn corkscrew. It's happened to me many times. I've also had a corkscrew break in the cork, which like I came prepared and it's still, I still wish I had a screw cap (laughs) wine. So again, screw caps. So much easier to open. They're great for when you want to take wine on a picnic, taking wine on the boat, you know, just like all you have to do, just screw that cap right off and you're good to go. You can also screw the cap back on. So they're so much easier to store the wine after you've opened it. Another reason that winemakers and importers are choosing screw caps over corks is that there are actually fewer faults that can occur in the wine as opposed to the corks. So have you ever heard of a wine being corked? This is actually a term, the the other way that somebody might say this is that it has cork taint. And this refers to the wine that has been contaminated by TCA, or the long name looks something like trichloronisole. That was probably not at all how you're supposed to pronounce that. Sorry. Anyway, TCA, it's a chemical compound. It is caused by mold in the corks or wood. And it unpleasantly alters a wine's scent. A lot of times if your wine smells anything like wet cardboard, wet dog, musty basement, these are all signs that your bottle has been contaminated by TCA or cork taint. You have a corked wine. And the thing is that sometimes that TCA can come from a not good quality cork, right? That's the easy way to see it. That That's, you know, that's what we have to blame. Other times there's not really a good reason for it. So the cork is just unreliable. Now it happens in a very small percentage of wines, like one to 2%, but still there's the risk. So winemakers like screw caps because you don't have to worry about that. And it also gives them more control. And speaking of control, there's another way that screw caps help out winemakers. What's really cool is the technology of screw caps has evolved so much that winemakers can select a screw cap based on how much oxygen they want to let in. There's actually these sealing inserts in the screw cap, and they, they have a certain way of like making them such that some of them will let in more oxygen than others. And this is important because one major concern for the cork versus screw cap debate is that a cork is porous, meaning that it lets in oxygen. And this oxygen allows the wine to transform and age. This is why you often saw like screw caps on white wines for a while before we really, and we really don't see them on reds still, but even more so. It was more on whites than reds because the idea was, oh, a screw cap, you want to drink that right away. It's no good for aging. But the thing is, screw caps can do that too. And now they can let in oxygen and the winemaker can control how much oxygen that they want to get into the bottle. So it's actually even better. Honestly, one of the questions I have after learning all this is like, so why do we still use uh, corks? And the answer, primarily, but I'd love for others to chime in is that it's just tradition. And that's kind of, it's like the romanticizing, like, I'll be honest, if I'm at the dinner table and getting ready to pour some wine for everybody, it does feel a little fancier if I'm pulling out a cork out of the bottle than if I'm just unscrewing the bottle. But hey, maybe we'll get used to all of it. Do you ever feel like you're stuck in a rut doing the same old thing day in and day out? You wake up, go to work, come home, go to bed, and repeat. When life gets busy, it can be easy to fall into that routine and forget how important it is to prioritize joy and fun. But what if I told you there was a way to break out of that cycle? A way to bring more excitement and adventure into your life. And it involves one of the most wonderful things in the world, wine. Introducing my Court Crew Virtual Tasting Club. This is not your ordinary wine club. This is a community of people who are passionate about exploring new flavors, learning about different wine styles, and having fun along the way. Each month, we'll select two styles of wine to focus on. We'll taste them together virtually, all while learning more about the regions that the wines are from and the grapes that make the wine. You'll also have the opportunity to meet winemakers, sommeliers, and other wine professionals through our monthly community events. But it's not just about the wine. It's about breaking out of your routine, trying new things, and having a little fun. 
imagine being able to impress your friends at your next dinner party with your newfound wine knowledge. Feeling confident when you walk into a wine shop, knowing exactly what to look for and what you'll enjoy. Imagine adding a little bit of excitement to your everyday life. So why not do something for you? Come join the Court Crew Virtual Tasting Club and start exploring the endless sea of discovery and joy that is the world of wine. Sign up at my website, corkandfizz.com slash the court crew. And don't forget to use code wine101 to get your first month free. And now back to the show. All right, on to wine myth number three. This is one that we hear so frequently, and I'm so ready to bust this myth. This is a myth that sulfites in wine cause headaches. Now, if you heard my latest episode with natural wine expert Molly Ring, you'll know that sulfites naturally incur in wine due to the fermentation process. Now, of course, we also talked about that some winemakers choose to add additional sulfur dioxide to keep the wine fresh. But here's the thing. Sulfur dioxide is used on so many other foods that you've probably never gotten a headache from. One of the biggest culprits, dried apricots. And honestly, any dried fruit that are still like the super bright in color. This just means that they needed to do something to keep that color showing. Frozen french fries also have it added in, as do most of the fresh and non-organic fruit at the grocery store. The thing is, sulfur dioxide is just used to help keep things fresh. Now, some folks do have a true allergy to sulfites and or sulfur dioxide. That's why wine labels are required to state that the wine inside contains sulfites. But again, this is just a small subset of people. If you can eat dried apricots and not get a headache, then I hate to break it to you, but the sulfites in the wine are not causing your headaches. What are causing the headaches? Well, there's a few different pieces to this. The first one is that wine, unfortunately, does contain, well, fortunately, unfortunately, however you want to look at it, does contain alcohol. And alcohol does mess with your system. And if you are not drinking enough water while you are drinking your wine, it can very easily cause a headache. There also depends on the quality of your wine. There are some wines where they the winemaker might have more sugar added in or additional chemicals. There are up to like, you know, again, going back to that natural wine episode, I'm trying to remember what number it is, but there's upwards of like 50, probably more than that, additives that winemakers can add to their wine, and any one of those could be potentially causing headaches for you. The last one, which I just recently learned about this um, within the last year or so, is that it could be histamines. So you've ever noticed like you kind of feel like stuffed up or like more allergy feeling after having some wine? That could potentially be histamines. Now, I'm not a doctor. The things that I said, the things that I read mentioned that you could take an antihistamine before drinking wine and that could help. But again, not a doctor. Please do not take that advice as such. It is just something I read and might help. (laughs) Okay, that was wine myth number three. Sulfates in wine do not cause headaches. They just they just don't, unless you're allergic, in which case you are one of the few and and you can tell me I'm wrong. Go for it. (laughs) Okay, moving on to wine myth number four. This is the myth that all wines improve with age. I feel like this is both like good news and bad news. It's like, yay, I get to like, I don't have to age all my wine before I drink it. But it's also like, oh no, what about that bottle that I've been saving forever? Are you telling me that I'm not guaranteed to have an amazing wine? Let's dig into that a little bit. So uh, long story short, if you buy like a $5 bottle of wine from the grocery store and think it'll taste way better in five years, it'll probably be too late by then. And you might as well have just saved yourself $5. The thing is, all wine has a lifespan, and it looks like a bell curve. If you're not familiar with this, imagine it's, I mean, it's its a curve, like you're looking at a graph, and it starts at the bottom, and it goes down just a little bit, and then it goes all the way up to the top. We've got our mountain, and then it comes all the way back down. There's that beginning part where it just went down the tiniest little bit. That's the beginning when the wine is first bottled, and it needs some time to settle in. This is why you don't see wines in the store marked with the same year that you are shopping it. 
This is also highlighted in the movie titled Bottle Shock, which the term bottle shock actually refers to that uh, this this thing, I'm just going to call it a thing, this thing that happens to wine once you bottle it and it needs a little bit of time to to chill out. So that's the bottom of our curve. Then as the wine ages a bit, it climbs up the curve and it reaches a prime. That's our very peak of the mountain. And that is when the wine reaches peak flavor and it just absolutely shines. This is the best time for the wine. But then shortly after that, we were at the top of our mountain. So we have to come back down and the wine does start to decline. It loses all of its fruit flavor to the point where it just becomes vinegar and it has reached the end of its lifespan. To be honest, most wines that are produced today reach that peak in a year or two. So how do you know if your wine is going to age? Well, for one, wines with high acidity, high tannin, and or high sugar levels can all age very well. However, one of the most important things to keep in mind here is that higher quality wine typically ages better than mass produced wines. So if you get your wine from the winemaker themselves or from the winery, that is a great time to ask them, when do you think I should open this bottle? Sometimes you might be be surprised that it's earlier than you might think. If you're buying from the grocery store, in general, most of those you're going to want to drink within the first year or two. Buying from a small wine shop, again, just ask them and ask them when they think would be a good time to open that bottle. All right. We have made it to our final wine myth, and this is if you've ever heard somebody swirl their wine or take a sip and look at the glass and go, oh, this must be a high quality wine. It has great legs. So first off, I'm sure the first thought that went through your head is, what the heck are legs of wine? Like, what are we looking at? Wine legs, also called tears, are essentially the droplets of the wine that form on the inside of the glass. And you can see these after you either swirl the wine and then kind of watch the wine go back down. Those are your wine legs. Or you can tip the wine to the side. Or after you've taken a sip, right, you've kind of tipped it to the side and you can watch it all kind of fall back down. These legs do not illustrate the quality of wine in any way. The only thing they can tell us is how viscous the wine is and how much alcohol is in the wine. And even then, it's not a for sure science. If you want to get all sciencey, this phenomenon is the result of fluid surface tension caused by the evaporation of alcohol. So when you're looking at those droplets of wine, if the droplets move very slowly down the side of the glass, chances are you have a sweeter wine. The sugar in the wine makes it a little bit thicker. Think about like syrup. You know how slow syrup moves and it's because it's so sweet. Wines that have more sugar content in them will also move slower. Now, if there are more droplets than normal, chances are you have a higher alcohol wine. And this is again that evaporation of alcohol. If there's more alcohol, there's more alcohol to evaporate. Now, keep in mind, temperature and humidity of the room can greatly affect the rate at which the wine legs form. So again, this is one of those where like, it's not a like full, complete science and like being able to read it and figure out, oh, they're moving like at this pace. It must be like 12 grams of sugar. Like um, you're not probably not going to be able to figure that out. But just know you are welcome to comment on the legs of your wine, but they're not going to tell you if you have a high or low quality wine. Okay, those were our five myths just to go through them one more time. First, we learned that you should not enjoy white wine straight out of the fridge and red wine at room temperature. And in fact, you want to enjoy them both right in between those two temperatures. Then we learned that in no way are wines with a screw cap inferior to wines sealed with a cork. Next, we learned that unless you have an allergy to sulfites, it is very unlikely that they are causing headaches after you have some wine. And of course, we also learned that all wines do not improve with age, which means if you've got a bottle in the back of your your closet that's been there for a while, isn't super high quality, maybe get it, try it out, or maybe dump it. No, no judgment here. (laughs) And then finally, we learned there's no such thing as great legs on a wine. It doesn't tell us anything about the quality of the wine. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Cork and Fizz Guide to Wine podcast. If you loved it as much as I did, I would so appreciate it if you could take a quick second to rate it and leave a review. And don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. I release new episodes every Wednesday. 
Next week's episode is going to be something a little different than normal. Every month with my court crew, I host a virtual community event. Sometimes these events are workshops hosted by me or other people, but many times they're in the form of a Q&A with someone else in the wine world. Back in September, I had the opportunity to invite Andrew Sides, the co-founder and winemaker at Lost Raw Cellars in Texas, to come chat with the crew. We had such a great conversation that I wanted to share this chat with you. Consider this your exclusive peek into the Cork Crew Club. Thanks again for listening, and as a thank you, I'd like to share my free shopping guide, 15 Wines Under $15. Simply head to my website, corkandfizz.com, scroll down to the bottom, and join my mailing list. Cheers! Cheers!